Coming up on Virginia Currents, we cruise along a high-tech highway that can help improve transportation of the future. Find out about the Virginia Smart Road. Also, hear the inspiring story of Brandon Farbstein, who went from being a victim of cyberbullying to being one of the top 19 under 19 most influential people in the world. And could our nation's most historic settlement be at risk of going underwater? Find out if Jamestown's in danger. Plus, we go to a tasting room with a twist at H. Shire's Colonial Distillery in Williamsburg with handcraft spirits in true colonial form. And hear the sultry and soulful music of Doe Eyes, all next on Virginia Currents. Welcome to Virginia Currents. I'm Amy Lacey. There's a high-tech highway that can impact what we drive and how we drive, yet not many people outside of the Virginia Tech and surrounding areas know about it. It's called the Virginia Smart Road, and it's owned by the Virginia Department of Transportation. Built in 2001, the Virginia Smart Road is a highly innovative tool used by car companies, tech suppliers, and the state and federal departments of transportation. They use it to research things like human behavior behind the wheel, automated car technology, weather conditions, commercial drones, and so much more. We visit Virginia Tech Transportation Institute to see what makes the Virginia Smart Road so smart. The Virginia Smart Road we actually built back in 2001 here in Blacksburg. It was really a test track that we wanted to put together that was a little bit more advanced than a lot of the other test tracks that are around the U.S. or even around the world. And the reason why we call it the smart road is that at the time we had layered in new sensors, had a lot more advanced communication capabilities, and some of the big parts that are most interesting are the fact that we can create rain, fog, snow, and really recreate about 95% or more of the overhead roadway lighting in the U.S really create any kind of environment to test technology, test out new vehicles, test out new pavements. There's 14 different types of pavements on the road. And so that's why it made sense for us to call it the Smart Road. Originally, and for many years, the Smart Road was about 2.2 miles long and it was mostly a highway kind of facility. Uh, recently, we've expanded upon this and we now have a rural road test track. And we, you know, we talked to a lot of our sponsors and, and we wanted to know what kind of track is really important for them in the urban environment. Asked them if they needed the you know, storefront facades and things of that nature. And in reality, what they really need is the ability to just test things functionally. If there's a building in the way, you know, can their sensors see around the corner? And this new surface street expansion, which is kind of like an urban and suburban layout area. We built this kind of new facility to allow it to be very modular and we can quickly change it around. Bus stops, sidewalks, change buildings, um, change the size of roundabouts, etc., which makes it really nice. Now we've gone from about 2.2 miles long, uh, we'll by the end of next year is be around 6.8 miles of new test track facilities. So we'll be able to test vehicles in the rurals and then bring them right onto the highway setting and then take them to this kind of urban suburban layout and do that all in one track. Control, copy. Uh, there's two of us in the Tesla at the highway gate. Can we get on the road? Yeah, I'll get the gate for you. Right now we're up here in the smart road control room and this is kind of a control tower where we have people staffed that are helping really monitor the roadway, allowing people on and off, making sure we're maintaining safety, helping navigate the interesting choreographed scenarios that we come up with. And you know, we have somebody up here 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just monitoring the road for safety. We do studies at night, obviously, with the overhead roadway lighting. And we have a whole group of some of the best researchers in the world doing nighttime visibility work. And I don't know if they've seen the sun any time recently, but they're, you know, they do fantastic work. And I would say you know, the smart road we've done over 25,000 hours, I think, of groundbreaking research on the smart road. It's being utilized 12 to 16 hours a day. A lot of what we do is doing designing technology around the user. So that's the human factors element that we do. And that human factors research is evaluating things like um, blind spot detection systems, uh, backup camera technology, um, auto brake, brake assist, um, navigation systems. We do a lot of driver distraction research here, understanding those components of uh, what is visually distracting to somebody so much so that you're, um, you're basically uh, increasing risk on the drive. So we're here to try to answer complex questions. 
Oh, what was that? An average driver will go 18 years before they have a police reported crash. And that's pretty impressive if you think of it. Humans are actually very good at driving. The safest drivers we have out there, or safer drivers, you know, they could go their entire lifetime without any kind of police reported crash. The issue we run into is that our 40,000 fatalities a year here in the U.S. is is that that still happens because we travel so much and the amount of exposure and driving we do, we still run into these issues. So the next kind of jump shift in safety and changing things is taking the human out of the loop from the driving task where it makes sense to do so that, and we can do it safely. We build a lot of cars here, take cars and we automate them ourselves and, and change how they work so that we can create different scenarios. We will create uh, some of these cars to actually self-drive but actually do it poorly. A lot of what we do is ready for psychological research and so we will set expectations for uh, new people that let's say have not had experience with self-driving vehicles. We'll, we'll set the expectation that they're going to ride in one but it doesn't work very well at all and then we'll let them ride in it and it works great and then we'll go ahead and look at how they use the car in that situation and then we'll reverse it. We'll tell them that they're going to be in a fantastic self-driving vehicle. It does wonderfully. And then we'll actually make it do um, pretty poorly on, on the road. We'll have it kind of ping-pong back and forth. And, and then we'll look at how much they'll trust and use the system then. And these are all kind of these research questions that we want to know is how much do we need to educate and how much do people need experience with these vehicles? Will that dictate whether they will rely on the system or not? A demonstration where we braking to avoid collision. And in order to put it in automated mode, I do it twice, and then the car is steering and driving itself. We have 70 million miles of naturalistic driving data out from all over, and we look at that to identify what what is happening before a crash occurs. Police accident reports you don't always get that. It's important with the new automated vehicle systems that are out there and the sensors that they use that we also design roadways and infrastructure to really facilitate these systems to work their best. So some of the things that people don't think about, especially as we enter this world into automated vehicles and self-driving vehicles, is that these sensors have restrictions and constraints about what they can do. If you can't see lane lines, for example, the self-driving vehicle cannot necessarily operate as, as it normally would. Some things like seeing around corners, you know, you still need line of sight. So these sensors still need to be able to see an object. Some of the things that we set up are the ability to use connected technology to help these vehicles see around a corner to be able to understand if another vehicle is coming. Another thing is if you have water on the roadway, covers up these lane lines, then you have headlights and it's nighttime, you can actually completely lose lane lines, both visually from you know, the human perspective, but also the sensors and cameras and technology that we have, they, they kind of disappear. So coming up with you know, state-of-the-art new lane line technology is, is kind of another important thing that we can look at here. But we can pull up lane lines and put them down and, and we can change all that with the facilities we have and really get down to what the most valuable part is. It's pretty surprising what people get used to and comfortable about doing while they're driving a the vehicle. So we've seen everything from brushing their teeth, putting on makeup, making sandwiches, reading books. Most things that people do in their home, they'll do in their car as well. The human factors research is really the most exciting for me and, and I think where we can make the most strides in saving lives. For more information about the Virginia Smart Road, which is also home to the second largest bridge in the U.S., visit the secure website vtti.vt.edu. None of us can allow ourselves to be paralyzed by hate in the world. That's a quote from Brandon Farbstein's 2015 TEDx talk in Richmond. It was the first time the teen shared a story about being cyberbullied and his call for people to use technology for good instead of pain. Fast forward a few years, and Brandon has now taken his platform across the globe. Awesome. Yo, what's up, guys? Hope you're having an awesome Wednesday. Thank you so much for hopping in. Um, what is your job? I am a motivational speaker, so... I was diagnosed with a rare form of dwarfism when I was two. I'm a 3 foot 9, 19 year old. Obviously not the average person. And I want to use what I've been given to help people feel 10 feet tall. To be able to use the things in their life, no matter how much of adversity they've had, they had to overcome, 
or what their struggles are. We all have one. Whether you choose to see that as physical, mental, emotional, whatever, it's something. And if that's been a roadblock in your life, it's time to take a step back. Realize, you know what, it's okay to not be okay. Whatever that looks like. There really is nothing that makes you uh, wrong or not fit in. It's something that can be a catalyst, like it has for me, to propel you forward. The very first week of freshman year, in high school, the cyberbullying started. It went from calling me out, saying how disformed I look because of my size. I used a mobility device that's a very cool bright yellow Segway, and that drew a lot of attention. And it got so severe that I started getting a new death threat every week. It was something that was absolutely toxic for every aspect of my life. And midway through junior year, I said, I can't do this anymore. The cloud that it's causing me to have 24-7 it's just too much and I got myself out, started online high school and it ended up being one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me because it was then that I was able to use my story to get now two anti-bullying laws passed in Virginia. I became a professional speaker at the age of 17 and I was able to learn that I don't have to be the victim, I could be the victor. And just how remarkable this life of ours is what I've learned is you don't have to be some huge celebrity, have somebody with millions of dollars to make a change or to impact somebody's life. Sometimes it's that one little thing that you do for somebody else that means absolutely everything for them. Whether it's sending them a text, just checking in on them, or waving to somebody you're passing by on the street that has a look of gloom. It's so simple and it takes seconds out of our day, but it means absolutely everything to that person. So that's what fills me up. You've received so many accolades. Now, what are some of these awards and recognition um, that you've received across the globe? I was 16 when I got named Style Weekly's 40 Under 40. I thought that was the coolest thing. And then a year later, I got named to an international 30 Under 30 list. And now at the age of 19, I'm in a 19 Under 19 list. And I'm so honored to be on that list for my activism work and what I'm doing in the speaking world, especially with youth and trying to empower as many people as I can with my story. What I realized after I got through the severe cyberbullying in high school was that it was a direct reflection of how those people were feeling, whether it was because they've been bullied or they don't have a great family life or they're insecure, whatever the many things could be. If you can say, you know what, I see that you're hurting, what can I do to help you? That's what I've done. And I come out on top. And if we're not telling kids that it's not okay to be this person that stops everything for somebody else by bullying or sending them horrible messages, it's gonna continue for the rest of their lives. Empathy is what we need to be teaching. And what is next for Brandon Farbstein? I want to be the person that I needed when I was at my darkest place. And to be that person, to be that light at the end of the tunnel means absolutely everything to me. I've had so many opportunities to speak all around the country at universities and conferences and companies, but there's no guarantee that I'll have what I have right now in the future. So this is what I'm gonna be taking advantage of. I'm so excited to be doing this as much as I can at the rate that I'm going, trying to change the world every single day. The most precious time is right now. It's about time that you live to your greatest potential. And no matter what you need to overcome, you can do it. And whether it's your age, your sexuality, your disability, your religion, that is a title that you think defines you, it's not. We create the definition of ourselves. That's up to us to define the life and live our greatest self. Brandon's first book, 10 Feet Tall, is now available on Amazon. You can also follow his journey to inspire on his website, brandonfarbstein.com, and on Instagram and Twitter. Just search for at Farbstein.
America's oldest known permanent European settlement might one day be underwater. Because of rising sea levels and climate change, Jamestown Island is at risk of having 60 to 80 percent of its landmass submerged by as early as 2050. What happens to this historic landmark and what can be done now to help prevent the rising waters? To help shed some light is David Gibbons, the director of archaeology for Jamestown Rediscovery. Thank you for coming in today. Oh, thanks for having me. Just explain to us exactly what is this problem? Well, it, it's really interesting. When we first started thinking about sea level rise and dealing with it, I thought, why don't we just hire a bunch of Dutchmen to come in and surround the island with a wall? And it actually turns out the water's coming from the ground up and so that threatens the, the archaeology out there. How does this impact Jamestown specifically? Well, a lot of what we're dealing with is four feet in the ground, like graves, human remains, uh, wells that are 16, 14, 16 feet deep. And so as the sea level rises, it pushes up salt water and other things that we are dealing with in our area. And you're even seeing the effects on trees already, which shows you how grave the situation is. Oh yeah, absolutely. So as that, that's one of the effects as the salt water comes up, it will kill the tap roots of the trees. And then when we get an event like a hurricane Irene or something like that, it, the trees get pulled over and they rip up a big section of the ground, which is uh, adverse to the archaeology, the resource. How many dig sites are being affected here? What is exactly going on there at that space? Well, throughout the island as a whole, so the Jamestown Rediscovery Foundation and the National Park Service co-operate co the island there, co-manage co and uh, own the island, and so we're working together. Uh, there's 50 some sites, over 50 sites that were that are threatened by sea level rise and climate change, and so that's a that's a pretty big number for for a site that's taken 25 years to dig an acre and a half, and the island's 1,500 acres. So what is being done now to address this issue? So we've banded together, largely as a, as a state organization, but also within the Park Service, who are our partners there at Jamestown. And we're assessing all the sites on the island and looking at how we can, uh, uh, actually it's a triage process, which sites are in front of the train and most in danger and which ones can be monitored over time. What can be done and can it actually happen that it can be stopped or you can slow it down? Well, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do to stop it. Um, but what we can do, again, is monitor, mitigate, meaning excavate where needed. Um, but unfortunately, it's a very dire situation. What other historic areas are at risk? Well, we know from, from our colleagues and, and working with other organizations throughout the United States that there are quite a few archaeology sites at risk. Within the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, Tangier Island's already seen a little loss of a cemetery, for example. And on the eastern shore, watermen are, are telling us that the, the barrier islands are starting to go. What about Yorktown? Oh yeah, well, the, one thing that's very interesting is it's not just sea level rise and inundation as the, as the land erodes away, the high bluffs, for example, at Yorktown, start to erode. And so that's another thing that I hadn't realized that affects both high and low ground. Can Jamestown be gone, in essence, in years? Yeah, that's, that's the problem, is that when you run climate change maps where it shows a rise of six feet, a lot of the island, like right in front of our office, is only three feet above sea level. And that's where, for example, John Smith first paraded the troops. They call it Smith's Field. And we're seeing that completely inundated year round now. So then what happens to all of the artifacts, to this treasure that we've, that we've known here in Virginia? Well, unfortunately, you have to you have to deal with it and excavate. Now, it's taken us 25 years to dig an acre and a half at the level that the resource deserves out of James Jamestown, the James Fort site. And currently, we're digging the site of First Africans in the United States, and there are other sites of First Peoples that are absolutely integral to the development of our nation. And that that's what's very scary is that that's got to be done. I know so many people want to get involved now that they know about this issue. What can the public do to help? Well, I got involved in archaeology up in Blacksburg, Virginia with a local chapter of the Archaeology Society of Virginia. And so when people ask me, how can I get involved? Either they're younger or they're retired, I say, look for your ASV chapter. And then with annual meetings, you get connected. It's networking and you discover where and when people are dealing with some of these sites. Um, and you can volunteer. The, the crew at Jamestown already has. So. 
such an eye-opening interview. It's definitely something we all want to take action with right now. Thank you, David, for coming oh, in today. Thank you, yeah. If you want to get involved in fighting the rising waters, go to virginiaarchaeology.org. And for more on Jamestown, go to historicjamestown.org. And I understand that you actually know the person who's featured in our next segment, Dr. Bill Dodson. I do, I do. So we met Bill. He's a local Williamsburg individual. And uh, he'd come out interested in history and brewing. And we gave him 10 gallons from a 1608 well and he's brewed something with it. It is so, so interesting. As part of Virginia Currents on the Move, we visit Dr. Dodson's Eight Shires Colonial Distillery. It serves up handcrafted spirits the same way it was done in the colonial days. Dr. Dodson was allowed to team up with Jamestown Rediscovery in excavating the graves and the wells from the early 1600s and retrieved glass stills and the last 10 gallons of water within the well. He plans to use those items to recreate history in a bottle. Dr. Dodson is an endodontist who performs root canals by day and gives tours of the distillery at night. In his lab, you will learn the history of whiskey and the process of how he distills authentic colonial spirits and specialty drinks. Let's go there now to raise our glass the colonial way. Here you go, sir. So we're trying to cover the history of uh, whiskey in America from 1607 to the middle 1790s. It was just a, a neat period to cover, nobody covered. There was no history available, no books written, nothing available. So we saw a wonderfully unique niche there. We started researching it and it was terrible to find facts on who made what when. And some of the claims were false. In trying to do some of the research, um, we decided to make our theme colonial. Hi, I'm Dr. Dotson. How are you today? Welcome to H. Shire's Colonial Distillery. When I do tours, I ask people this question. What do you think is the oldest of the drinks that we drink today? Could you tell me? Let me, let me give you a clue. It's either scotch, bourbon, rum, or gin. Anybody know? Is it gin? Very good. He said he wanted to do something. He wanted to find something to do. I was like, what else are we going to do? Because we've had a fun-filled life. We really have. My father, who was the first oral surgeon in this area, uh, looked at me and said, well, there's two pieces of advice that I can offer you. Retire when you're uh, young enough to retire. Don't work until you're too old. And the second thing is, um, retire with something to do. So we started into it and some local people heard about what we were trying to do. And this gentleman walked in, Mr. Eisenhart, and said, I understand you're trying to do historical whiskey. He said, my great, 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 great grandfather worked for George Washington and made stills and helped repair the wheels for the Whiskey Rebellion. And I have the original patterns for the stills he made. And Mr. Eisenhart in 1750, this is his design for a quick still that could be made for the homeowner. But then another lady walked in and she said, I'm an archaeologist from Carter's Plantation up the road. I have the first still made in America. And even more exciting than that was Jamestown Rediscovered, the archaeologist out at Jamestown doing research on the origins of our country. Um, walked in about a month later and they said, Bill, we've got the only 10 gallons of water ever taken out of a Jamestown well since 1609. And they had excavated the well all the way down, looking at the different layers, pulling things out and saying, you know, where did this come? How did the co first colonists in, from England in America use these things? And I said, can I have it? And I know what to do with it. So they were gracious enough to give me that 10 gallons of water. So we're trying to make an as authentic a product as we can of, of what would have been drank by the colonist in the 1607 to 1609 period. So you can actually come over here and look, look in the tank if you'd like. This is actually a batch of bourbon that's fermenting right now. Williamsburg is a uh, tourist mecca. You come here to find out about the history of America and we're trying to recreate a piece of that. Um, we love people to come out, support, see, touch, feel. It creates a, an experience that in, in Williamsburg that you can't find in a lot of places around America. To find out more about the tasting tours and history, visit 8shires.com. She's heard my cry One too many times Who has been fly This week's Spotlight on Virginia Music shines on indie rock artist Doe Eyes. Back in Richmond after being in New York City, Ali Thibodeau has a soulful and sultry voice that can also belt out her cleverly crafted lyrics. Doe Eyes is Ali's solo project. And in 2018, she launched a crowdfunding campaign to record her debut full-length album, expected to be released soon. After the release, she hopes to start touring again. Here now is a clip of Autonomy.
Thanks for watching Virginia Currents. Join us next time for more inspiring stories. I'm Amy Lacey. Close my eyes and see.